Okay, so uh, welcome back. The next few segments of this class are going to be all about parsing. Uh, as you will notice later on, uh, parsing is one of the most important technologies uh, used in natural language processing. Uh, many uh, further components such as text summarization, question answering, and machine translation uh, rely on successful parsing for them to succeed. So let's consider the problem of parsing. I'm going to start with an example from parsing a programming language. So we have here a C program to reverse uh, a number. Uh, you're all familiar with the syntax of programming languages. They include variables, uh, blocks, uh, statements, and so on. What is, however, very important about computer languages is that their syntax is unambiguous. This is not the case, however, for human languages. Human languages are very different in many different ways. Can you think in what ways uh, they're different as far as parsing is concerned? So, uh, there are no types for words. So, unlike computer languages where we know that a certain string is a variable or a comment, in a natural language we don't know whether a certain word is a noun or a verb automatically. There are no brackets around the phrases. Uh, unlike programming languages where we have for statements and if statements that have very explicit bracketing around the statements that compose them. There's also a lot of ambiguity as we've talked about before. So the ambiguity can be at the level of the individual words or at the level of parsers. And there's also a lot of implied information which makes uh, human language parsing even more complicated. For example, uh, in a given dialogue, uh, one of the participants in the conversation may be referring to an object that was uh, visually available but not part of the text. It's also possible to refer to knowledge from the outside world that is not uh, obvious from the sentences in the text. So what is parsing? So the parsing problem is essentially to associate some sort of a structure, often a tree structure, with a sentence. And this is done usually uh, using a grammar, uh, very often a context-free grammar. Uh, there may be exactly one such tree structure given a sentence and a grammar. There may be many such sentences, in which case uh, you want to pick the one that is most likely or most appropriate. Uh, or it can also be the case that there may be none, in which case uh, that particular sentence would not be uh, parsed successfully by that grammar. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that grammars are declarative. This applies to all grammars, including context-free grammars. Uh, so what that means is that you can use a grammar to describe a sentence, but you cannot automatically come up with a method to convert the sentence into a parse tree. You have to augment the grammars using some code. So in other words, uh, the grammars are not sufficient to specify how the parse tree is going to be constructed. Uh, we've talked about syntactic ambiguities before. Let me just remind you of uh, those a little bit. So we have problems with prepositional phrase attachment. So in the sentence, I saw the man with the telescope, we can have one interpretation where I used the telescope to see the man, and another interpretation where I saw a man who himself was carrying a telescope. So this is a PP attachment problem because the prepositional phrase with the telescope can attach to either uh, the verb of the sentence, so, or to man, which is the direct object. We can have gaps. So for example, the sentence, Mary likes physics but hates chemistry. Uh, it is clear that the subject of the second verb, hates, is also Mary. However, this is not explicit from the structure. Uh, so a successful parser should be able to infer that uh, Mary is the subject of both verbs, not just the first one. Coordination scope is another interesting ambiguity. If we have a sentence like, small boys and girls are playing, we may have two possible interpretations. The first one is that the boys are small and the girls are of any age, whereas uh, second interpretation is that both the boys and the girls are small. So this is an example of a coordination ambiguity, and it's called that way because and is a coordinating conjunction. There are many cases where a certain word can be considered as either a particle or a preposition. For example, if you say, she ran up a large bill. The word up here is used as a particle in the phrasal verb run up. Uh, so she ran up a large bill is interpreted as she incurred uh, a large bill. Whereas if we change this to uh, she ran up a large hill, in that case up a large hill is a prepositional phrase and the word up is not attached directly to the verb ran but rather it is the head of the phrase up a large bill. 
Another example is the dual use of some words as both gerunds and adjectives. So a gerund is a verb form, whereas an adjective is a, something completely different, a different part of speech. So a typical example would be something like this. Frightening kids can cause trouble. So the, there are two interpretations here. In one of them, frightening is an adjective and just modifies kids. In the second example, it's a gerund, in which case we have frightening kids as in to frighten kids the action of doing that can cause trouble. So let's see what kind of applications of parsing there are. So the first one is in grammar checking. So every time you go to your favorite editor, you will be able to see uh, some feedback. So if you type a sentence that doesn't look very grammatical, uh, you will uh, see it underlined and you will have an, a chance to correct it. For example, if I want to say, if I say, I want to return this shoes, the grammar checker will parse the sentence and recognize that this, it's ungrammatical and it will suggest to change it to either I want to return these shoes or perhaps this shoe, but not these shoes. Another example is question answering. So if you have a question of this nature, how many people in sales make $40,000 or more per year? Uh, you need a parser to be able to recognize that you're looking for a record in a database where uh, the record is about a person and that 40K is an attribute and so on. Another example is machine translation. As we know from before, uh, different languages have different word order. So for example, a language that is subject, object, verb, when it needs to be translated to a language that is subject, verb, object, uh, would have to undergo some syntactic transformation. So, uh, we have to do this in parsing. The next task is information extraction. In information extraction, we want to recognize uh, different phrases and how they uh, relate to each other and also what are their types. So in the sentence, Breaking Bad takes place in New Mexico, we want to recognize that Breaking Bad is the name of a TV show and that New Mexico is the name of a state. And there are many other applications, for example, for speech generation, for speech understanding, for interpretation of sentences, and so on. So the next topic is about context-free grammars. We've mentioned them briefly in the past. We're going to go into a lot more detail this time around. So what is a context-free grammar? Context-free grammar is a four-tuple uh, consisting of the following four uh, symbols, N, sigma, R, and S. Uh, what are those? Well, N is a set of non-terminal symbols, for example, uh, symbols for sentences, prepositional phrases, verb phrases, and so on. Sigma is a set of terminal symbols. Those are uh, words, for example, Mary or uh, John or like, and so on. And it is uh, assumed that the set of terminal symbols is distinct or disjoint from the set of non-terminal symbols. There's also a set of rules uh, where on the left-hand side you have a non-terminal symbol, A, which is a part of uh, the set of non-terminal symbols. On the right-hand side you have beta, where beta is a string that can combine any uh, symbols from sigma and n. You can have any number of those from zero to uh, a large number. And finally, s is a specific designated start symbol in n. When we parse entire sentences, s happens to be the sentence symbol, but in general, there's no reason why a context-free grammar cannot be used to parse uh, some other syntactic constituents, for example, noun phrases or even entire paragraphs. Okay, let's look at an example. On the top line of the slide, we have a sentence that we want to parse. Uh, the sentence is the child ate the cake with a fork. And the grammar that we have here is a context-free grammar with eight non-terminal symbols. S for sentence, NP, PP, and VP for noun phrase, prepositional phrase, and verb phrase, respectively. DT for determiner or article in this example. N for noun, preposition, and finally we have some past tense verbs. You will see that uh, some of the uh, rules have uh, options. So, for example, a noun phrase can be either a determiner followed by a noun or it can recursively call itself and turn into a noun phrase followed by a prepositional phrase. So, it is this kind of uh, alternative rules that would uh, bring us to uh, multiple parses for a given sentence. So, one thing that I want to point is that uh, the phrases, the things that have appeared as the last symbol, NP, PP, and VP, are all considered to be headed 
uh, constituents. What that means is that one of their components is more important than the others. And this is not surprisingly the noun for the noun phrase, the preposition for the prepositional phrase, and the verb for the verb phrase. So heads of constituents is a very important concept that will come up again in the later slides. So let's look now at some more examples uh, and understand why phrase structure grammars are important in parsing. So the first thing that we need to realize is that sentences are not just bags of words. So for example, the sentence Alice bought Bob flowers is distinct from the sentence Bob bought Alice flowers. So clearly, uh, a parser would help us understand that in the first sentence, Alice is the subject or the doer of the action, whereas in the second sentence, Alice is the recipient of the action. So, uh, phrase structure grammars enforce what is known as the context-free view of language. That's why the expression phrase structure grammar and the expression context-free grammar mean the same thing. So, context-free view of language tells us that a prepositional phrase would look the same whether it is part of the subject noun phrase or part of any verb phrase. It will have the same internal structure. So, constituent order uh, is very important. As I said earlier, some languages are subject, verb, object, and others are subject, object, verb, and there are some that have all the other four combinations of subjects, verbs, and objects. So some grammars can include additional uh, constituents, for, for example, auxiliary verbs. For example, the dog may have eaten my homework. So may and have here are auxiliary verbs. Imperative sentences or sentences that describe orders, for example, leave the book on the table. The sentence doesn't have an explicit subject. Interrogative sentences end in question marks. So for example, did the customer have a complaint? So there are two types of interrogative questions. There are yes, no questions like this one here. And there are WH questions, for example, where, when, and so on. There can also be negative sentences where the main verb is negated. So the customer didn't have a complaint. In this case, did not or didn't is the expression of negation. So let's now look at the longer example that incorporates uh, some of those types of sentences. So we have now a few new rules. On the first line, we have sentence uh, that was uh, used to be a, just a noun phrase, verb phrase. Now we have two additional options. So can you figure out what changes were made to the grammar to make it more powerful than the previous example? Well, the, the answer will be on the next slide. So uh, let's look at some of the changes. So one of them is on the first line, we have now uh, a new rule that turns a sentence into auxiliary noun phrase, verb phrase. So for example, something like, have the children arrived home? Uh, and we also have a new uh, concept of a nominal, which can be either a noun or it can be a nominal followed by a noun. So this way we can create sequences of nouns where the first one modifies the second one and so on. And we have now moved the prepositional phrase from under noun phrase to under nominal. So it's a very different structure syntactically. What's also new is that uh, the verb phrase rules uh, include a rule for just the VP turning into V. So this is a, an example where uh, we have uh, no direct objects and no prepositional phrases. So that would be uh, what is known as an intransitive verb. So here's an example of the Pen3 Bank. The Pen3 Bank is a very large resource for uh, parsing information that was manually built at the University of Pennsylvania in the 90s. It has been extensively used for training uh, parsers over the last 20 years. Uh, we'll revisit it later on, but for now I just want to give an example of a realistic sentence that was included from the Wall Street Journal. Uh, as you can see, uh, there are two sentences here. Uh, the first sentence is marked on the top with S, and the second one is in the bottom half of the page also marked with an S. The first sentence has a noun phrase subject and a verb phrase, and the second one does too. Uh, and then you can look at the rest of the information on the slide. You can see that the first sentence has some additional constituents such as adjectival phrases or HP, in this case 61 years old. Uh, the second sentence has a modal verb or an auxiliary verb like will, and so on. So uh, this is just to give you uh, an example of a realistic sentence that is very much unlike the toy examples that we looked at so far. Let's now discuss the idea of a leftmost derivation. If you are given a grammar and a sentence, there is a one way, uh, there is a unique way in which uh, one can parse the sentence by always expanding the leftmost unexpanded non-terminal. So let's look at this example. 
Uh, so the leftmost derivation is a sequence of strings S1, S2, all the way to Sn, where S1 is the start symbol, uh, for Sanders that will be S, and Sn, the last thing in this list, only includes terminal symbols or words. So here's the example. We start with S, and then uh, we replace the S with NPVP by applying the row S goes to NPVP. Then we replace the NP, which is the leftmost unexpanded symbol so far, with the terminal noun verb phrase, and so on and so forth, until we finally get the child ate the cake with a fork, where uh, everything in S is terminal symbols. So let's look at this uh, graphically. Uh, we have an S at the beginning, we want to expand it into a sentence, so we, S is the leftmost symbol, S goes to NPVP, now the leftmost symbol is NP, we expand NP, the terminal noun, the leftmost non-expanded symbol is the terminal, we replace it with a word, that's a terminal, so we can stop here, now the leftmost unexpanded symbol is N, we replace that with child, it's again a terminal symbol or a word, so we can move on to VP, the VP now gets expanded to VPNP, because this is the first row with VP as the left-hand side. Now the second VP that was just created needs to be expanded, so that gives us the verb 8. We have one left thing to expand, that's noun phrase NP. So the first row for noun phrase in the grammar is noun phrase prepositional phrase. We now expand the newly generated noun phrase to get the terminal noun, and then we expand the determiner and the noun into words. And we have now the prepositional phrase to expand. The rule for prepositional phrase is that it's something that starts with a preposition and is followed by a noun phrase. The preposition becomes the word with, and the noun phrase is a determiner followed by a noun, and then finally we have the determiner turn into the, and the noun turn into fork. So this gives us the leftmost derivation, given that grammar, and given the sentence the child ate the cake with a fork. Now, you should realize that this is not necessarily the correct semantic uh, interpretation of this sentence. This is just the one that comes up first when we follow the leftmost derivation principle. 